welcome to Wrestling and Everything Coast to Coast with your host, Buddy Sotelo Esquire, and wrestling's premier photographer, Dr. Mike Leno. And we have a longtime guest that I can almost as equally introduce as you can, uh, uh, Mike, and, and that is the voice of all pro wrestling in many other Bay Area federations, and that is the, the great golden tones of Alan Bolte. Thank, Thank you for you. joining us tonight. I'm looking forward. It's been a while. Dr. Leno, it's been a million years since I saw you. Let me let me say this because Russ initially tried, I think, the last two years to get you on. I gave you a holler. But Alan is one of my dearest, good friends, true friend. We've never had a crossword since what, 73, 74? He came in. Victor Barry left, but Victor was only doing the program for Roy Shire. Alan Bolte not only was ring announcer. But he also did the program, which I don't think anyone in any territory, other than Larry Matisic for Sam Munchnik in St. Louis, did. Yeah, maybe, maybe yeah. Jeff Walton in L.A. Maybe. Um, true. You're you're right. You're right. But you did not only commentary on TV at times when like yeah. Hank was off, Hank Renner, yes. but the ring announcing at the Cow Palace and other venues, not just oh, the yeah. Crown Jewel, the right. Cow Palace. With exactly. the golden tones, and no one else was writing the California Wrestling Report for Wrestling World Magazine, but Alan Bolte. Correct. Yeah, at one point I was writing for nine wrestling magazines: Wrestling Confidential, Wrestling World, The Ring Wrestling, Wrestling Review, and doing all the programs for all the cities. So I started announcing for about a year and a half before Victor decided to to move, and I took over the programs there. And I am proud to say that I made a lot of money in those days, believe me, <laughs> especially for that time. Selling the program for a buck w was quite a bit. Every battle royal at the Cow Palace, we totally sold out. I would sell about 3,500 programs at a buck apiece, so you can figure it out. And that went really well until Shire finally decided to kind of let it go. L let me ask a question, and I'll throw right to, to Russ so he gets some time. Um, I want to go, I know Russ probably was going to ask this, but I don't even know this. Tell us how you discovered wrestling, you know, like as, as a fan. And then I think you started working for the magazines or how did you get hired by Roy? Yeah, I wrote the first wrestling magazine. I did a story on Pat Patterson for ring wrestling. I was barely 16. I took some pictures at channel studio TV. I did an article, I sent it in and they bought it. I remember sent, getting a check for $50, which was a lot then. And I was very young. And I was always a fan all my life, a wrestling fan. I loved it. I never really wanted to wrestle. I really did want to announce. So having all that happen was just fantastic. I remember meeting Louis Miller, the local promoter. He had an event at the Richmond Auditorium and the announcer did not show up. And Louis said, you're going to announce tonight. I remember it was superstar Billy Graham, Pat Patterson, and Ripper Collins in a six-man tag. I just loved it. I did the whole show real well. I kept thinking to myself, I don't want this to end. Sure enough, Louis said, you're, you're good. I'll put you in Stockton next week. And then when I was in Stockton, a couple shows later, Roy Shire showed up at, at the venue. And, and eventually he said, I'll keep you in mind, you know, I'll put you in the cow palace if you're good, you know. So then that happened. And, and the, then Victor with the programs, it all just escalated from there. Did you and have like, an, Oh, go ahead. Alan. I've known you, like you said, maybe I started announcing in 74. So I've known you that long. And you are the most recognized, the very best wrestling photographer slash journalist slash historian you have always been able to keep in touch with all the big name wrestlers all throughout the years and and i'm glad you're doing well and really well I, I totally miss the bay area I, I feel my presence up there with russ we could get our golden state warriors to win on the road <laughs> it seems to be you know ping-ponging i don't know how maybe <laughs> Russ, i can get into that later how the lakers got to start home game you know game one which they of course won in game three so it seems to be home field advantage for our warriors but alan before i throw to russ did you have any ring announcing or vo vocal training how did you know that was going to be your gift but, and your passion? Or not, no you know it 
a voice is something you either have or you don't. You can practice it. You can take lessons. Same thing with a singer, a dancer. Either you have to have a little bit of rhythm in your body. You're born with it or you're not going to be a singer or, or a dancer. And I think kind of the same thing with, with announcing. Practice, yes, but it's got to be something inside of you, and not everybody has it. Well, that's but amazing. No formal training, no. Mm-hmm. So the one thing that unites us all is the uh, memory of Roland Alexander. Oh, God. Uh, yeah. And All Pro Wrestling. So can you tell me how you got connected with All Pro Wrestling? I met Roland. He would hang around. When I started announcing, he would hang around the Cow Palace, San Jose. Uh, he and uh, he would he knew Dave Meltzer. I mean, there was just a click there. Steve Pardee, Eddie Giovanetti, they all ended up breaking into business eventually. But remember in those days, it was very kayfabe. In fact, I announced it was a year and a half before Roy would even have me come up at the dressing room to get my instructions. It was that kayfabe. And finally, Louis Miller said, he's smart already. He loves the business. He's not going to hurt it, you know. So, and they didn't want people like Roland or, or Eddie or any of those guys. He, they, he, he was afraid that they were kind of marks, that they would hurt the business, which was the opposite. Not at all true. So then when uh, Roland started his training camp and then started doing live shows, uh, there I was. And I, I told Roland, I, I can't announce all of these shows. I'm a, I have a real estate broker. I own an office. I've got other stuff, too. But I sure would love to announce once in a while when I can. And Roland did very well for a long time with his shows, you know, all over Northern California. And Mike, you and I did a couple uh, shows with him uh, two or three times. And we were all really saddened when when we lost Roland. He Here's somebody who loved the business from the day he was born. And he, he kept saying, I want to get on this business somehow. If, if it's a wrestler or a promoter, or somehow I want to get in this business. And and he did. And he deserved he, it. He uh, he learned how to take bumps and stuff, as Russ knows. But he um, also was kind of an expert who I would go to. You know, whatever knowledge I have, I picked from, you know, friends like Roland or yeah. Eddie. Eddie Moondog Moretti, one of the yeah. nicest guys oh, on yeah. the planet. Yeah, Nicest guy. And I remember towards the end, you and I were on tons of Roland shows and you would always, <laughs> whether it was a Kirk White or a whoever right. you were ring announcing, uh, you would always point me out at ringside, which yeah. was nice and yes. appreciated. But, but uh, Roland was an expert on roller derby. And because I was allowed, you know, my primary home base was Los Angeles for LaBelle. And I started flying up before I could even drive. And Dave Meltzer and his mom, he couldn't drive either. We were too young, early 70s, for Roy's bigger shows like the Cow, the Battle Royals, right. etc. Right. Uh, but I went to San Jose Civic first for a, a Swensky show. <laughs> yeah. It's policeman before I went to the Cow Palace one. But, I, you know, I would come up there. Meltzer and his mom would pick me up. I would stay overnight. They'd take me to the airport to the next day. But Roland was an expert on... Um, the classic roller derby, the more athletic San Francisco based Jerry Salzer, yeah. whereas my being my primary home base shooting for the program in LA, which is where I started working for all the magazines, um, I, mine was roller games. And when Jerry Salzer, so yeah. Alan, let me ask, were you into or involved? You know, they seem to be, you know, roller derby, roller games was like wrestling on skates, high speed. Yes. Were you also into that? Because there seemed to be a total crossover, particularly in Northern California. Yeah, a, a little bit. You know, remember Walt Harris was the TV announcer for both wrestling, National All-Star Wrestling, and Roller Derby. They had Roller Derby every Sunday night, Keysar Pavilion. Channel 2 would film it. Every Friday night, wrestling at KTVU in Jack Lemon Square, Oakland. And the, the funny thing, wrestling and Roller Derby were huge at that time. And they would pack every arena, and they would all go to the same venues, Cow Palace once a month, Sacramento Auditorium every couple of weeks, San Jose, Stockton, Santa Rosa. And they both were drawing very well. And it wasn't like they really competed. The fans seemed to come out all the time regardless. Uh, it was very exciting on TV before Ch- KBHK TV 44, before Shire lost Channel 2. And then it grabbed 44 and, and Hank Renner in Sacramento, Channel 40 and all that. And, and you know up. the story of that because 
I, I really prayed and hoped you would have come to some of my TV show, This Is Your Life Things, because I did a number of them for Walt Harris, as yes. well as the one I did with Roy and Hank Renner. But yes. Walt, when Roy got kicked out of Channel 2, whatever year that was, 1969-70, for continually right. spinning on the floors after his <laughs> cigar juice, after being totally warned repeatedly, do not do this yeah. or you're done here. And then he then he has to, to scramble and he gets, you know, the only TV he could film is in lowly Sacramento, whereas Channel 2 was the premier non-network. Yeah. It's been the whole Bay Area, Northern California. He's stuck going up there. Walt Harris told him, I'm not driving from... You know, his home was like uh, San Jose, uh, I think. Yeah, even further, like uh, Los Altos or some okay. really Los Gatos. It was Los Gatos, really yeah. expensive there. He goes, I'm not driving all the way up there because I have too many roller derby commitments. And right. so that's how Hank Renner got into the picture. A thing that few people know, and I don't know if I've told you this, Alan, you may have already known. Uh, Hank Renner's middle name was um, uh, Gearhart or, or Kaiser, one or the other. Huh. And when Gary, you no, know, it was Gear, it was Gearhart because Gary Kaiser, when he became Gearhart Kaiser, took Hank's middle name. That's where that came from because it huh. sounded perfect to manage the von Brauners and von Steigers as a German heel. And yes. uh, the TV that. show for the first seven eight years. Although I had Andy Calvello co-host it with me when when uh, Gary Gearhart Kaiser, Roy's, you know, longtime heel lead manager. Russell appreciate that. Um, had to move away. He was he was searching the whole country for his ex-wife. So he moved to Indianapolis from California and then uh, Florida. But so then Annie Calvello, who was like the fabulous mula of Derby, seven decade skater, total great talker, only one of oh, a kind. Yeah. We all love to yeah. miss Annie Calvello. Uh, and the weird thing was Annie, so she would set up and bring all the Derby people for me and I would have all the wrestling people and she told the story when Pepper brings in Bonnie, his last wife, of how they had an affair in Honolulu because in December of 73, they both, I guess they both had tour, or they uh, Derby had tours of Japan and Honolulu, and Roy sent a bunch of wrestlers like Pat, of course, yes. and Pepper to Honolulu for Ed Francis because there was a long-time working relationship, Roy Shire, San Francisco. I don't know if he had part ownership for a little while until Blair's might have bought him out, but... He was sending wrestlers to Honolulu, and Derby is there, and Annie Calvello from Derby and Pepper Gomez, one of the top wrestlers in the whole world, had this affair there <laughs> while he was married. And so she sputs that, but then she also told us how Jerry Selzer, who they were all pissed at, and this was a dignified guy who founded Bass Tickets. Oh, yeah. Multi, multi, multi multi-millionaire before he died. Yeah. But Jerry Selzer pulled the plug on, on the classic Charlie O'Connell, Annie Calvello, Joni Weston, Jan Vallow, et cetera, roller derby, December 73, after the Japan and Honolulu tours, saying that it just wasn't profitable any longer. And so a lot of those skaters, most notably Joni Weston and Ann Calvello, had to go to the more theatric roller games, my home base in L.A. And that's where I first met Joni Weston and oh. Annie Calvello, who I was, you know, lifelong friends with, like you. And Do you remember, Mike, uh I think you were at the Cal Palace, I think. Ann Calvello showed up in the crowd, and the word got back, and we asked her to come back to the to the back dressing room area, and I was going to give her a quick shout-out. We have a special star here in the crowd tonight. Wow. What would superstar? And she told me, Ann told me, remember, I'm the one who started the orange hair, the purple hair, the, the yellow hair nothing to do with Dennis Rodman. I started it long ago and he stole it from me later. <laughs> I constantly said that on TV. She used to have like when Elvis was big in 56, 57, 58, she would have a guitar on, you know, a drawing of a guitar painted on one side of her head and then a silhouette of Elvis's head huh. profile on the other side. She was way ahead of it. Uh, yes. Russ, I can't tell you what a unique, and she loved wrestling. Anytime yeah. I would try, when Kirk White started having his early little mini fan fests or signings, mm -hmm. uh, the first few of them, and I'm not trying to put any credit on him, but I did nag him to give free dealer tables to Ann Calvello from Derby, yeah. from wrestling, Pepper Gomez and Kenji Shibuya. And my wife and I would drive Kenji and, and Pepper there 
as well as Fritz von Goring, the original Paul Diamond. These are all wrestling yeah. legends. And yeah. he knew all of them, as did most of the other skaters. So when I did those, This Is Your Life, Walt Harris, again, Russ Roy's very first wrestling announcer. Yeah. He did all of it. But he also did it with Pepper Martin doing Pepper color. Martin. The very first guy yes. doing color commentary in the entire world for wrestling was Pepper Martin, yeah. another friend of ours. Yeah. Who and just they were died. good. Pe Pepper I, and I Hank. I tell you, about a year ago, Pepper called me and he said, Mike, I'm on uh, hospice care. Oh. And he knew he only had a few weeks to live. And I was close with this guy. When he wrote his book, he sent mm -hmm. me the draft to proof and put photos in it. And and when Luthez wrote his own book, I forget if it was called Hooker, he sent it to Pepper to proof, it, you know, on his end. So Lou trusted this wrestler who became a top, top actor, director, screenwriter. Oh. I mean, Pepper was massive in Hollywood, just yeah. on the likes you know, similar to H.B. Haggerty, hard-boiled Haggerty, right. uh, Russ. So we have all of these fantastic people in our Bay Area, more so than even Hollywood, you know, where I'm li living until I moved up, lived 40 years in the Bay Area, moved back. So, Russ, let me throw back to you. Oh, okay. You are going so far memory lane there, that, you know, before <laughs> I was ever born. It's kind of hard to, to, to make but it But you up. appreciate it, Russ, because I know you love your, your Bay Area wrestling history. I do. I and do. It was so cool. I got to tell you. Wait, no, I was, you've had some time there. I wanted to, to, to say, we, we, let's talk to our guest here and have our guest tell you a few things about, about his experiences. So when you got into uh, uh, all pro wrestling, that was like when, like the mid nineties? I, I would, that, that's a good time. Yeah. And, and then, Roland was around all like, like Mike. Roland had been attending all the events since since he was young as well, and knew all the history, knew everything that was happening. Now, Roland there. didn't start doing shows. He did the school 94, 95 ish. So his first show was either late 96, early 97 that, in Modesto. That's, that's exactly and I was right. there. I was there because Roland had a guy dress up in a white doctor suit, a heel manager. He called him by my name. But the, uh, more notably was some fan threw a brick through the car, and uh, it hit Chris Cole in the oh. head, I think it was Chris Cole, if you remember that, Chris broke Colt? the windshield, and Chris Cole, not Chris Colt. Oh. One of Roland's wrestlers, he had the Cole oh, brothers. Okay. Yeah. Us might remember Chris Cole, and he got injured pretty badly, and his brother did too. So, And they were baby faces, they weren't even heels. So that was Roland's first show. So uh, Alan started as a ring announcer, I'm, I'm guessing late 97. He had somebody else do it at first, but then he went to the best, and Alan Bolte later. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and he ran a lot of towns. We had Hills, Hillsburg going, Santa Rosa, Vallejo, uh, VH1 recorded part of for a documentary they were doing. Uh, they were recording stuff, a, a documentary on Andre the Giant, and they interviewed me for my experiences with Andre. Andre was in my house in, in Albany, Berkeley, uh -huh. uh, years ago. Pat was over there. I remember one time we called for pizza. I was I was maybe 18, still living with mother in Albany. We called for pizza. The pizza guy looks in the house, points over to Pat and says, you're Pat Patterson, the, the wrestling champion. And Pat says, you know, who the hell is that? A lot of people say that about me. I don't know who he is. <laughs> yeah. And what was it like having Andre the Giant in your house? Well, he bent over quite a bit. You know, he was a super nice guy, as everybody knows. And he picked up the tab wherever he went. Uh, whenever Roy could bring him in for the territory, every single arena was packed. I mean, he was huge. But I know that he was hurting, being so tall, so big, even on a plane, even on first class, a, a king-size bed, his feet would, would hang over. So he was always really hurting quite a bit. And I think that the, his activity in, in wrestling helped, you know, helped keep him going because we sure lost him. Very, he was very young. Yeah, it wasn't too long ago that that actually happened. So tell me about some of the stars that you saw come up in wrestling at uh, All Pro Wrestling. And who were some of your favorites to work with? He had a lot of, 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 of real good talent. Uh, what about the great Kali? I think there was confrontation. Yeah, Dalip, Dalip Singh was the name that he used, his real name then. Well, there's no question. He did get his training from Roland. And, and there was this yeah. big fight about sh should Roland get his percent or not. 
he definitely worked for Roland for a long time, did some of the live shows. He was huge physically and, and he was, he didn't speak English much, but, but he was learning that there was a big name. He had a couple guys with hoods. I can't quite remember their name, but, but they were very good. Mike modest, of course, was tremendous. I always told Mike, he just like Ray Stevens. I mean, yep. his moves, his yep. looks. And then there was big Mike diamond. Uh, those Max, guys Max were Diamond. all, Max. yeah. Well, Max yeah. Justice was another name, but he was initially billed as Mike Diamond. He wrestled as Mike Diamond for a couple of years for us. Yes. And okay. he turned into Max Justice, you know, about, say, 1999. Yes. Was that? And uh, Steve Rosano, the Gigolo, and Vinny right. Massaro, who was a ref. Roland had him as a ref for a year and a half before he even allowed him in the ring. And then he was a little Dick Grimes, you know, with a hood on the team mm -hmm. with Vic Grimes. We so had... You were also at so Vallejo for the uh, for when uh, XPW came up, and that brought up guys like you know uh, the prototype, who of course is yes. later going to be John Cena and Samoa yeah. Joe and Frankie Kazarian and and Looney Lane, and we so we had you know those XPW stars come yeah. up there, and you did the. It was a nice feud, you know. It was a better feud than. Be not because Roland did anything wrong, because Roland tried to make those two feuds that fizzled with BTW work, and it was because Kirk White was just too lazy, but because um, Rick Bassman of UPW in Irvine, Southern California, Orange County, right near me, was a student of the game like Roland and loved the biz, loved MMA, he made sure it worked. There was a lot of nice involvement between the two promotions, UPW and APW. Yeah. Yeah. And culminating in that first King of the Indies, 2001, Spanky, I mean, literally everybody. Cena was already gone to OBW, but uh, Samoa Joe and uh, uh, the J Keiichi Sakota came up as a tag team, but Samoa Low Joe was attorney. Was, was a big part of that first. Yeah, Samoa Joe worked for Roland quite a bit. Uh, Volcano. But Chris Daniels was already coming up regularly, but he was then part of UPW with Frankie Gazarian. They weren't teaming yet, but they came up. Again, uh, Spanky Brian Kendrick, who's tremendous talent. We had and and uh, Scrap Iron. Uh, Adam Pierce. Yeah, Adam Pierce, who's a WWE quote unquote official, whatever that means. They're doing a bang up job, but I mean, all of us were friends, and uh, UPW had tremendous talent. APW had tremendous talent, and uh, and it's nice to see some of the younger guys really make it in the business. It's so good to see somebody who just loves the business. A, A what's his, L.A. Knight, he used to work as uh, Drake, Eli Drake. Yes. He did a lot of stuff for, for uh, Kirk White and some of the others. Uh, Frankie Kazarian, it's nice. Uh, Brian Tremendous H. talent. Yeah, it's nice to see them make it the big time. Uh, L.A. Knight is definitely a hell of a worker, and he's definitely big in, in WWE, and I'm glad for them. They all took their bumps. They all drove three hours to wrestle for 50 bucks. I mean, <laughs> they all did that, and now it's paying off. So tell me about, like, some of the interesting challenges that come, because uh, my brother also did announcing, too, uh, oh, you know, okay. for my California Championship Wrestling, and so, you know, he's part of that, and I had to do it for a couple of matches, and, you know, for me, even though I do promos all the time, Doing announcing as a ring announcer is a different sort of character than when you're you're trying to be a manager and insult the crowd. So tell it me is. about some of the nuances about. Being I remember the first time I ever announced at Cal Palace, my uncle bought me a real nice kind of a tuxedo suit, and everybody kept saying, "Don't be nervous, don't be nervous." There's about twelve thousand people in in the palace. Uh, Patterson was there, Shibuya, as Shibuya toward the end. But I really, I loved it, and I really wasn't nervous. I mean, I had my notes. I, I, you look out at the crowd, and you see, you know, way up in the balcony. But bigger concern is, you know, would I trip over the rope, or would I drop my cards? Or, but you know, Roy was was pretty hands on with his instructions, you know, and you didn't dare fuck up. I remember one time only. I guess I did a major fuck up. <laughs> and did he get all over me? Baldy, I fly mighty Igor into the cow palace. And you call it a fucking semi-main event. It's first main event, second main event, 
third main event, Boldy. Don't ever do that again. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, Roy, I get it. <laughs> Let me ask you, Alan, very uh, before I lose this train of thought, I, again, what I was about to say earlier was I remember uh, Meltzer would be sitting there taking notes. So I'm shooting ringside and uh, our Eddie, you know, Moondog Moretti, Giovanetti and Eddie would be sitting there with Roland. But often they would stand in the back of the cow palace. They're trying to pick up girls while watching wrestling. So they're like multitasking. <laughs> but Roy was unique. And the only promoter I know who was ahead of his time before what we call some of the freak show MMA companies, which is where Dalip Singh ended up. Roland wanted his cut. They brought him to Japan and then CML Mexico for wrestling. But Japan initially for the MMA and where they were just looking for freakishly big or different guys. So Roy, for his battle royals only, I think at one of them, he had Andre... Haystack yeah. Calhoun, who was billed as 601 pounds, but yeah. the Mercury twins, Roy was like the major promoter using the Guinness Book of World Record heaviest twins ever. They were like 640 and, and 640. Wire ones, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so you have Andre, you have Haystack, occasionally Man Mountain Mike coming up from LA, who was yeah. actually heavier than Haystack, and the McCreary's. And I just thought all of them in one battle royal, that's no one, no promoter was doing that. I mean, we were would alternate. We never had Andre and Haystack yeah, in the I, same battle royal. Roy right. did. I, I remember that. I think that was would you think that was maybe 78, 70? No, it was before, yeah, maybe 78 or 75, because the 76 one was the one that Fuji won. Okay. And I think the one after was the one Morocco won, which was a terrific battle royal. Yes. I mean, Roy's, I, I, as great as Roy's cards were, the, the Battle Royals were special. He was the only promoter who put the Battle Royal on first, which is why Russ yes. uh, Roland copied that. And the reason for that, I finally asked him, and Roy said, well, a lot of the guys are doing me a favor, like Bruce or Brody coming into Roy's second to the last Battle Royal. Brody only agreed to come. He's on his way to Japan, so he said, if I can be on first, I can Zoom to you know, SFO to yeah. hit the, the, the thing right. to Narita Airport in Tokyo. And that's why Roy had that, that on. And then he would sort of lie. We'd have these incredible matches advertised. Hardly any of them would occur because many of them, like the Funks, would have to go to SFO Airport to go to Japan. And then Roy would just have you announce, oh, yeah. X, X, XYZ got injured. They won't yeah, be in the matches. We've had to change some of the matches. Right. One of those, though, I, I was advertised, and I was we we're going crazy. Sheik against Dory Funk Jr., but that had to be scrapped. Sheik, I think, no showed, and Dory had to go to the airport, so we didn't yes. get you know. But Mike always was able to get the inside scoop. <laughs> you know, but you remember though the last the last Roy Shire Battle Royals, the main event. So the opener was the Battle Royal. The main event would be Harley Race defending the title against Chavo Guerrero. And then yeah. the next second to the last one against Ray Stevens. The only time Ray ever got an right. end of a title right. match. And the last and very last Battle Royal, Pat wins. And then in the main event, he goes against Harley for a terrific, terrific NWA title match. That was Pat's also, like Ray the year before, his only NWA world title challenge to any champion. Mm. Amazing. Yeah, I I saw myself on YouTube when Ron Starr was the Battle Royal winner. That Was that maybe his second to last? Ron no, Starr I, I think that was like 77 or 78. Okay. 78, 78 because 77, I'm pretty sure, was Morocco. Okay. 76 was Fuji. Well, remember the big scandal, and I've been asked on other uh, shows about this, with Fuji and Teru Tanaka. The, the strange thing, I knew nothing about anything roy didn't say anything in the dressing room i don't know i don't know what you know well, russ doesn't know this some for some reason yeah. alan you might know fuji was u.s champion couldn't make it <coughs> well, so toru tanaka is longtime tri wf partner for vince senior toru tanaka is you know semi-main eventing for us in la roy asked for him to come up and he puts a mask on him and they call him yeah. fuji and, yes. and, and Alan, take it from there. And, and, so what happened, Fuji and Roy got in a big fight, I think about a week earlier, and Fuji left the whole territory. So this was, the, it was already filmed Monday night at Channel 40. They taped Monday night for the Saturday Cow Palace. So the taping was done. It was Fuji, title match. Fuji's gone. 
The only guy he could get was Jeru Tanaka, who really did not look like Fuji. Fuji was taller. No, not at all. Fuji, Fuji was a little, uh, I think Tanaka was a little huskier. So as soon as this guy gets in the ring and I introduce him as Fuji, Roy didn't say a thing to me. So I think he really kind of wanted to kayfabe it like this was a last minute, I had no choice kind of thing. And fans are yelling and fans are well, coming up to me at the, at the <laughs> timekeeper table oh, and security saying, you, you got to get back. And they're saying, that's not uh, uh, Fuji. Tell him that's not Fuji. And I'm, I'm looking like, you know, I don't hey. know. But, but he got into a lot of trouble with the commission for that. Instead yes. of, why wouldn't you just say Tanaka is taking his place, Fuji's injured or something? <laughs> well. Because everybody knew they were this major, major two-time, before the yeah. Usos became the longest tag champions, Tanaka and Fuji were the greatest Vince Sr. Tri-WF world tag champions in the 70s. Right. They held, you know, almost. I think the yeah. Samoans often seek a beat that in the 80s, but in the 70s, there was no touching Tanaka and Fuji as a tag team there. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's what happened. And he pulled it off and he drew a big crowd and he didn't have to give any refunds. And and then it just. But he right. got in trouble big time with the it commission. Did. And then yeah. the, the whole thing. What was the deal with Buddy Rose who got on the mic, a hot mic? OK, that was another really uh, interesting night. So Rose and Roy Shire had had big heat. Ro Rose was accusing Roy of not paying enough and that Rose was a bigger draw. La, da, da. So in the dressing room. Uh, Rose says to me, I'm going to uh, give me the mic. I want to say a few things. And I said, well, let me check with Roy. And he's saying, no, don't don't check with Roy. I'm just telling you, just give me the mic if I get in the ring. And Roy was in the other room. I don't know what conversation they had. but sh So I said to Rose, look, Roy signs my check. He's not telling me any of this. I consider him a friend. If you're going to come in the ring, you make it look like I'm trying not to give you the mic. Push me, grab it, do whatever. And so there, sure enough, Buddy Rose comes in the in the ring, taking the mic. Roy Shire, you're stiffing all the wrestlers. <laughs> I keep walking away with the mic, and then he grabs it and pushes me. And so that part went well. And then apparently police, I don't know if Roy called local police to come. Yeah, yeah, that's what Roy told me he did. Yes. And, and they thought this whole thing is a part of the show. It's all a work. You know, they're not going to get involved. So that that kind of backfired. <laughs> and he really knocked Roy. He said, you're stiffing us on the pay. And I'm people come out to see me. On and on he went. And I'm just standing there, you know, listening. The fans are booing. And I, I see Roy way in the back. Uh, so that was a kind of a wild night. But but Buddy was the U.S. champ then. Yes. And, and what I heard, I wasn't there that night, <clears throat> was that he almost came out of the the fans seats it didn't look like he was coming straight down from the dressing room is that your recollection that he like came that, out of nowhere uh, buddy i i don't recall that i i don't think i noticed at what point did he pop up and and get in the ring i don't think i i, I remember on the pat patterson's book talking about the cow palace one thing he said that i never he's right he said that of all the arenas he's wrestled all over the world, the Cow Palace is the longest distance from the dressing room to the ring. <laughs> you got to go up about 18 steps to get into the dressing room for one thing. So you're going down 18 steps and to walk that huge Cow Palace, to walk halfway through the arena to the ring. He was totally right when he said that. It, it's a hell of a long. But a so long how, did, how did Andre that because even in the 70s walking stairs was difficult for andre he, he did it yeah sacramento also had stairs but maybe 12 two flights of stairs in sacramento to get to the dressing room and cal palace had two dressing rooms on opposite ends and so that was crazy they, they weren't even big they you know they were kind of right small. right they did have showers you know a lot of those smaller venues don't even have showers so they can't shower when they're done wrestling. They just got to bring in a couple towels. But Cal Palace w was pretty good, you know, for that time. But he had, there were two separate dressing rooms. So he would send the women to, to the other dressing room and, and the guys here. And the heels, if you remember, would walk down the left aisle. And the babies would come down the other aisle routinely. So you know which one was a baby face, which one was a heel. 
You know, I, I think uh, Roy used women more than even Mike LaBelle in Los Angeles. Roy, and he, I think he pretty much exclusively used Moolah's girls. You know, like Donna Crescentello and Tony yes. Rose and Vicki Williams, those great names. And it was Sandy Parker and, and a little bit newer generation. Sandy Parker and Donna, a couple others. Lee Lanakai is a name I, I remember. Yeah, yeah. And whenever Andre or the women or the midgets, anything different like that, all those small towns, Stockton, Sacramento, they would pack. They just love seeing something different. So yeah. let me ask you, though, and then I'm going to ask Russ, who would you consider, though, in Roy's territory to be actual draws, meaning any time they were on a card like Andre, you knew you were going, you could perhaps up the ticket price, but you knew the attendance was going to go up. So let's say Andre, do you think women and midgets? I, so I'm going to say it's a given Ray and Pat. But yes. The two wrestlers. Say women, midgets, any other stars that it was a guarantee they were going to raise I the think, I, I think Andre truly was, was the greatest draw when Andre the Giant was in town. Roy tried, and he would often stay. Patterson had his nice house in Redwood City with a pool and a view. I was there a couple times. He would have Davey Rosenberg, the publicist, over. He'd have people at the house all the time. And that's where Andre would stay. And, of course, they both spoke French quite a bit. So there was that real good in. But whenever Andre was, Roy would always try to get him to stay for two weeks, do Sacramento, do San Jose, do the whole territory for two weeks and then take off. So he tried to do that. When he was able to do that, every single one of those venues was packed. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. So can you Battle me? Royals were always a big draw, a Battle Royal. He wouldn't give Louis Miller, he felt like Louis Miller's a little bit competition running Oakland, Richmond, so close to the Cow Palace. But one time he said, Louis, I'll give you a 10 man battle royal, you know, and that packed. Battle royals would pack. Six man tag matches seem to draw. Hey, but Scott, Louis wasn't competition. Louis running Roy's shows just in a closer uh, proximity in Oakland. And, and we you know, what I mean? know that, but, but that's how Roy felt. And he didn't want to give Louis the, the best talent. <laughs> he wanted to save it for the Cow Palace. Like he told me, the Cow Palace is the plum. Just think that way. The Cow Palace is number one. So what I wanted to know is, is one of your secrets to, to announcing. How do you, because you do have that rustling announcing voice. How do you get into that voice? Yes. How do you get <laughs> well, into that voice? Well, it's not easy when you have two, three nights in a row. I can see where some of the singers, you know, in Vegas, in Vegas they used to do two shows a night. I've never seen Diana Ross, my favorite. Uh, Eight o'clock dinner show and then the 12 midnight show. And each show is about an hour and 15 minutes. You wonder how do they, they have to have an off night where, where they lose their voice a little bit or, but just, it's just practice. Just don't ever lose it. Hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> was it, but the, was there a secret to like how you would get like your projection and how you would like, did, was there a certain part of the audience you would always target to make sure that they got your voice or something like that? Not really. It, it depends on the venue. A, sometimes a small venue is more difficult than a big, huge cow palace. Because the big cow palace, you know the numbers are there, but you don't really see their faces. You don't really see. You look up in the audience. When you're in a small venue, it's kind of like eye-to-eye -eye contact. It's a little, little bit uh, tougher, I, I would say. A small venue like Modesto or, you know, even some of uh, Roland shows, some of them were smaller maybe four, five, six hundred people. Yeah, oh, well, we had our hundred, you know, person shows. Thank God you weren't there at oh, some God, of those, yeah. the bomb yeah. scares. But uh, uh, what's what was the biggest show that you ever announced at? Uh, probably the Cow Palace Battle Royal each January. We knew that would pack. We, I sold out the programs. I never could learn. I should, I should have brought 500 more. You know, and I would announce, slight delay, fans, packed crowd, the traffic is a mess, give us 10 minutes, fans. He'd always start about 20 minutes late, you know, just to kind of get them going, <laughs> always. <laughs> and they, the fans would start stomping their feet. Yep, you know. I remember that every time. <laughs> and tell us about your real estate business and how long you've so, been running that for. Yeah, that's where I'm now. I, after Roy kind of closed the, the territory, Tory, I says, well, I need to do a little something else. For some reason, I got my real estate license and I hooked up with a broker uh, in Albany where my house is and 
to this date, this has been about 37 years ago, to this date, our office is in the big tower uh, right off 80. There's a big 17-story tower right near Berkeley, Albany, right off 80. The only tower, the next one is not till Sacramento. And this building had this a big banner saying, if you lived here, you'd be home now. Right. Yes, I try to that, that a lot. Yeah, people still remember that. So Alan, let me ask you, about the uh, Albany though, and, and then keep going. Yeah. Uh, did they get rid of my favorite Barnes and Noble that was in Albany? Is that gone now? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's gone. Oh, and you and I have had lunch several times in Albany, Mike. Yep. We've met up here a couple times. Uh, yeah, I was born and raised here, and I really love it. Right, right near Berkeley. Easy to get to the city. You're Mark. still in the same house, right? Yes. After yes. all these decades, the house I we bought, were all at. I love it. Yeah, I bought a house across the street about 30 years ago as a rental, thank God. So that tripled. So that's all good. I was going to retire about three years ago. Then COVID came, and I thought, well, I can't really travel. So I, I'm still here. I, I need to find a real good broker to, who, to take over because we do property management. I, I can't just walk away. So I'm kind of working on that now. Nice. So... Can you tell me, because you have been in the Bay Area your whole your whole life and, and done wrestling your whole life, what do you think sets the Bay Area apart from other territories? Because last week we had a, uh, we did a Portland, Northwest sort of regional thing. So what do you feel is like a thing that sets Bay Area wrestling apart? Geographically, we have a very good location. You know, when, when Shire promoted he would put most of the wrestlers in Hayward. Geographically, that was the best location for Fresno, uh, San Jose, Sacramento, Cal Palace. So geographically, we, we have a whole, th that's a good thing. And and the Bay Area is very diversified, uh, as you know. Uh, I always kind of thought LA's territory w was a little bit uh, better, really. LA, all the other towns, they would ra run outside of, uh, out, outside of Los Angeles. And of course, the history with the Olympic Auditorium, as they're calling it, 18th and Grand. Tremendous history there. Yeah, but, but the Cow Palace was bigger. I mean, yeah, those were much. my home base venues. The Cow Palace was bigger. It had a, a more fabulous form feel to it as a spectacular yes. 18, building you know, for the Grand Nationals. Eight. You know, and, and whereas LaBelle had San Diego, he had Pete Collins running San Diego, and he had Bakersfield, San Bernardino, Ventura County, El Monte, which Jeff Walton ran. Roy, though, you look at the breadth of that because he had Reno for X period yes. of time. Yeah. Swensky doing San Jose, Vegas. Louis, yeah, Stockton, Modesto, Sacramento, yeah. the partnership with uh, Vegas. Now, when did Vegas start? Later 70s, right? Or Much later, yeah, you know. toward the end. Um, <laughs> Victor Barry and I, in fact, before Victor left, he would bring me with him. We'd fly to Vegas, so I would help sell programs and do all that kind of stuff before I started announcing. So I remember being in Vegas when it was hard, nothing like it is now. I don't know if either of you have been to Vegas recently, but it is packed from the airport all the way to old downtown. Unbelievable. Oh, yeah. Uh, if, yeah, Fremont Street. Was that what, what venue did Roy run in Vegas? Do you remember? I know that when Vern Gagne came in, he ran out the showboat, and they had TV going out of the showboat. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I, I, Reno, I remember the venue was called the Shy Clown Hotel and, and Casino. I don't – in Vegas, in fact, yes, it was the – he ran at the convention center, the Las Vegas Convention Center. Okay, that might have been the precursor to the Thomas and Mack Center, which is a much bigger oh, yeah. convention center where wrestling yeah. is run now. Um, let me ask, as we're winding down a bit, and Russ will have some more questions, in terms of like memorabilia, and you may not have that at your real estate office now, what are some of your prized memorabilia I, I have from, a, say, the 60s and 70s? I thought of bringing some of that. I have a ton of posters still. Richmond Auditorium, Stockton. I must have a ton of those. I have a lot. Of, I have every program that I did for the Cow Palace. Maybe if we do this again, I'll bring some here and hold them up. I've got a lot of good posters. I, I put a couple of pictures of them on Facebook, but I don't as, as much as I should. But I have a, a, the program with Andre the Giant and a six man tag at Stockton Auditorium, Patterson, uh, Andre, and somebody else. I have some of the old photos. 
Kenji Shibuya, pictures from Channel 2 Wrestling. I don't have a huge uh, amount, but uh, the posters and the programs. I do have a lot of the magazines that I wrote for from the 70s and 80s. Oh, let me ask this, because Alan was unique, Russ, also making different programs for the different cities, but your Action Wrestling magazine yeah. was, I think, the longest, best wrestling program because yeah. it was many, many pages long, stories, photos. Yeah. Whereas most, like if you look at Vince McMahon Sr.'s thing, it was one piece of paper, glossy paper, right. folded right. in half, so it had four sides. That was his program. Alan Bolte produced a program that was often 28, 30 yeah. plus pages long, you know, a real magazine. Every, every, and the new issue came out with every cow palace. That, that was where the new, I remember one time I had sold the same programs. So I won, I took the Cow Palace program early and sold it in Sacramento three days before the Cow Palace. And it got back to Roy and he had a fit. That's when he went on about the Cow Palace is a plum first. Think of the Cow Palace first. <laughs> now, is there any kind of an online archive of these magazines or? No, there was a website, Kayfabe Memories, and I did a lot of uh, real, real, you know, stories for them, real things that happened and shoots and stuff like that. But I don't, I don't think there, there really is. Um, I keep in touch with Jim Fitzpatrick. You remember him? Oh yeah, My, yeah, the roller derby, right? Yes. Right. So he and you know, roller derby tried to make a bit of a comeback, and I just, it just didn't quite. One of the co-promoters with Jim, and then they became enemies, Tim Patton passed away. He was kind of very heavy, yeah. about 400 pounds. He was uh, really instrumental. I went to a lot of those, and he would have, half of them would be like legendary roller derby and roller games people. Like he'd bring up Honey Sanchez from the T-Birds, and uh, uh, Skinny Mini Gwen Miller, and Ronnie Washington, and all these guys. But he, he would have the derby folks, and then he'd try to indoctrinate some young kids. So it was a nice mix, uh, and it just kind of stopped. You know, they had, for two years in a row, they had uh, like two weeks of roller derby it, it just about 10 years ago at the Pleasanton County Fair, Russ. Ah, yeah. And they brought the, the real true bank track. It wasn't like the flat track a lot of these. They're, they're, you never know when something like that will come back in, in as a fad. But, uh, but no, I, I would hope maybe some of those incredible – you know, uh, uh, newsletters and programs that you wrote up could somehow survive, you know, for the next generation if they care so much to, because it's yeah. a lot of great history there. But leave it up to Alan, because that's Alan's uh, legal intellectual property. If that, Alan know, wants to I'm put it up. Should... But what I hate, I, I hate these fans. They, they call themselves historians, which is bullshit. And they put up people's video and yeah. then they credit it to themselves. They had nothing to do with it, and nor have they asked. They don't know if it's right. cop still copyrighted. The copyright's been maintained. Yes. So if Alan were to do it, Russ, that would be great if he chose to put up his work. But it, we'd want to make sure Alan was fully credited. This is his content. Yeah. This is his creative and process. About that down the road. You know, you are mentioning about the World Derby. Do you remember in its heyday, you had the L.A. Thunderbirds, the, the New York Chiefs, the Bay Bombers. I mean, you had all these in and out all over the country really successful but the difference between roller games is those teams were all fictitious the new york whatever the team was called they did not play in new york they just were yeah. all based in la satellite yeah. little cities and when another yeah. team the jersey devils yeah it would just be people stationed in la whereas roller yeah. derby Jerry Selzer's in San, based out of San Francisco, Oakland. Yes. They were legit teams that would skate and they'd be baby faces in their territory. The te the uh, Bay Bombers would go there. They'd be the heels. So right. that was more legit, like a real, like Major League Baseball or something or the NFL. Yeah, exactly. But they had a lot of teams, De the Chicago Red Devils and, you know, on and on it went. But I also heard that the part of the problem, the setting up the, the roller derby track, the, the the rink you no know, it took forever and it was expensive yes. yes took forever and was much more than setting up a wrestling ring that's one benefit to this. and sometimes you don't even need a ring you know yeah you, some of these guys will will go crazy now have you announced let me also throw in uh i also announced what they called incredibly strange wrestling which right I think mike saw some of that that was very big we were packing the fillmore 
like every other month. So you did that for years. The weird yes. thing was Audra McDonald. I think that was yes, her name. Audra. Johnny Legend came up and brought it. He was the one that came up with it in yes. Los Angeles. His yes. sister, Lynn Margulies, was fiance to Andy Kaufman. She Correct. went to she went to the San Francisco Academy of Art, which is right next door to my medical practice at 450 Sutter in downtown San Francisco. But anyway, uh, he brings up incredibly strange wrestling, which is you know he has lucha libre, you know right. lucha movies in the background. He has you know Rock the crazy music. wrestlers, but he brought legit wrestlers. Like that's where the guy, uh, the Samoan that died that used to do the thumb thrust. That's where he started as a teenager. Russ, okay. he was yeah. on those. And then Audra like stole it and and kept calling it incredibly strange wrestling. But she was very successful. She was a better yeah. marketeer than Johnny Legend was. And Johnny, you know, kept yeah. saying, oh, I should sue her, but he never did. And she had that going for years. She came up with the thing of throwing tortillas at the 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 boys. Yes. And she's a she's very well versed in San Francisco. She has a lot of connections. She's very good with publicity and such. Uh and she used a lot of the pro wrestlers. Johnny Payne, Psycho Johnny Payne, my, my good friend, worked for her as well as in the... Lay Emperor, yeah. that's where Tom started. Lay Emperor started yes. there. There's another Remember? one. Good. Yeah, I came uh, and shot those. Those were a lot of fun. And you did the commentary. What was the guy's name who's an author? Something Barry? Count Dante. Count Dante <laughs> was the other. He was the heel announcer. I was the baby announcer. And he did a book on... Yeah, art. about the, yeah, the karate thing. Deadly yes. thing. But you were incredibly strange wrestling was unique in that you guys they put it over the loudspeaker so the fans could hear you guys. Whereas yes. most wrestling, you didn't hear right. what the announcers were saying. But this right. it was on a amplified. Yeah, we did color commentating live <laughs> at the show. Yeah. Uh, interesting, Audra still has Jerry Monty's wrestling ring. The, Roy uh, Shire had that ring, 16 by 16. She argued it's 18 by 18. I don't think so. It's that's what he used in the TV studio for all Channel 2 and Channel 40. Very easy to take up and down in one hour. Audra still has it. She was going to sell it to, to Kirk White, and then that kind of fell through. So she still has that ring. You know who she bought it from? She bought it from Jerry Monty's mistress, right. Edwina Burns. Yes. And when Jerry died, Edwina yeah. had it. Audra gets it. But she yes. never did sell it. And and some one of the, the big, tall workers for... Uh, BTW built Kirk his own ring, what I was told. Yes, right. <laughs> so Audra still has that ring in her. But she hasn't stand. promoted wrestling in how many no. years? Years and years and years. Right. Yeah. <laughs> what a waste. Yeah. And that's a lot of history right there. Oh, yeah. And the Fillmore, uh, Incredibly Strange went down a little <laughs> bit when they lost the Fillmore because that was a huge venue. Uh, and ever since then, she kept moving it. She moved it to a nightclub to here to there. And the Fillmore didn't want it because of all the, the, the tortillas, and it was a mess to, to clean up. But eventually, they just said, this is not for us. But Audra had a good three years at, at the Fillmore. I, I had photos in the Bay Guardian and the, yeah. uh, S, uh, yeah. the uh, East Bay Express of the aftermath. You'd see like a million tortillas yeah. and trash all over the floor. And that is a historic Fillmore West. That was a pretty historic, yeah. right on Gary at the Fillmore. Historic yeah. venue, you know. Still there. And in fact, ba the, the Brock's Boz Skaggs is, is making a comeback. And he's going to be doing a couple shows there next month. Wow. So it's still there and still drawing quite quite well. Doesn't he still own one of the clubs, the music clubs in yes. San Francisco? Slims, yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah, Audra, Slim. Audra ran some shows <laughs> at Slims toward the end. Yeah, but it just eventually, it you know, it, it ran its course. As we, you said. know what? Before we let you go, I remember Audra had an ISW show on the uh, that punk tour, and it was down at the Embarcadero outside. Oh, and you were the ring announcer. Huge. The, yes, I announced huge. They that was huge. It. She wanted me to go on tour, and I just, I said, I've got too much going on here. She, they ran a whole bunch of places across the country. It, and it was like a tennis shoe company. And they would do these annual rock concerts, and she yeah. got her way in there and put on these they shows. Did. It was good for the boys. And they did very well. Yeah. Well, so so have you announced your final match yet, or you still, you know, could do one more? Your your voice sounds I, great. I still have it. I still have it. When when uh, we lost Kirk White, which I was very sorry about that. Uh, I never knew his wife, but for some reason, she, she was uh, a saint. She was a yeah. saint then, but she has done Alan wrong and not 
continually using him. Why wouldn't you want the voice of BTW? For good or bad, whether you liked or disliked Kirk, yeah. the voice of BTW is Alan Bolte. Yeah, 22 years. Announced for them, 22 years. The announcer before me, his name was Ron Head, I believe. Uh, he had a he's kind of gimmicky announcer. but I he, like Ron. He's a fun guy. Yeah, okay. And, but uh, he's been out of the business a long time. The weird thing was he, Jeff Benson, J.R. Benson, and Cornette's current wife, Stacy Goff, who was a valet, she started out learning bumps at APW. She did the yeah. lesbian angle where they replicated ECW's thing with her and yeah. Miss Gina. Yeah. Carla Filbert was her real name. But they, uh, Stacy Goff, not Brenda, her sister, Ron Head, Jeff Benson, they all decided when Cornette started up Smoky Mountain, we're going to move back and uh, Cornette is, or OVW, where Cornette's going to give us work. And he did have Ron Head do announcing for a little while, but I don't know whatever happened to them along with their videographer, for uh, which is Peter Hines. So the only one left standing out of all of them, I don't hear Ron Head's name anymore. I hope someone can disprove that because Ron, you know, Ron did his sticky comedic announcing, not like He's Alan. He's a nice guy uh, when I met him. I, yeah, I, he's a good, so he was special. a good friend of mine because they did an offshoot of Johnny Legend's wrestling called Extremely Strange Wrestling, not incredibly. Oh. And they oh. would go, they had a commissioner, they, they had it as like a poor man's ECW. They had a commissioner who was a San Francisco street person, a legit San Francisco street person. And they would film these vignettes with him. They'd tell him what to say in advance. But, you know, the guy was out of it. But so Stacy Goff becomes Jim Cornette's wife. She's the only one that came, you know, became a big deal and survives to this day in wrestling. Uh -huh. well, one of the best things that you did Mike was, and I know you had a bit of a run-in with Kirk o over the whole thing. When he brought Patterson in for the Fan Fest, you he, got he didn't. A, I did. He asked me to nag yeah, Pat. Pat had never done a convention before, and so I had the connection to Pat, who had kept telling Kirk no. So I got him to do it because X amount of years, uh, Kirk White had me and paid me 150, which was nothing to do all his PR, free TV. Yeah. On uh, Channel Four with Gary. Yeah, what Rose. I was going to say, you got Pat on on Channel Seven News on the radio stations. You did so much for him that whole weekend, and the place was packed. Well, course. every year he got he only got the wrestlers on uh, what was the ESPN affiliate in San Francisco, the the big mega one. Um, the I, sports I, leader KNBR. Oh. I got those deals for Kirk every single year. I would get Brett on three, four times. Because yeah. I would go in with them, and yeah. then uh, we got I got Piper on, and I got Pat on. Piper twice, yeah. Honky Tonk Man, some of the other ones. But that very last one, the that last fan fest that I got Pat to agree to come yes. in for Kirk, for the fan fest, and Pat sang karaoke there. Kirk yeah. stiffed me, stiffed me up one fifty that he fucking owed me, yeah, and that's yeah. when I I I I went <laughs> off on him, and uh, you yeah. know that's when the heat started with Kirk White. I know. For stiffing me, he couldn't even buy that kind of PR. He couldn't buy oh, I know. fifty thousand watt ESPN had, station. He, San Francisco. You had him on everything. You yeah. had and on the, the newspaper. I even got him a couple of yeah, in, in my Chronicle. column at the Examiner, but yeah. some some blurbs in the Chronicle, which is the more prestigious newspaper in Northern California. I, I always like to give a quick little Pat Patterson quote: "Let's go have a drink or ten. Yeah, <laughs> keep it all That's with great. So, and, and wait, wait, I got this one. Uh, Bully Ray, Bubba Ray Dudley always says in WWF time when Pat was Vince's number two, he would, when, when something really went over or like Hogan came out there or John Cena and the crowd popped, uh, Pat would go, the place went banana. Yeah. You remember Pat ever saying yeah. that? Yeah. Place went and banana. Monso every other word, Gorilla Monsoon, it was two things. Oh, give me a break. Mm -hmm. well, the other thing Monsoon would always say, oh, please. Yeah, would you please? <laughs> would you please? Anyway, um, so uh, we're, we're winding up. We're, we're at the end of the hour, if you can believe it. And, okay, well, you know, Russ, that many to, years of, of not being in, you. in touch, good we're, to we're you, finally Russ, in touch again. Mike, a pleasure. We go way Well, Alan's one of my best friends. I mean, Alan yeah. and I have been friends probably longer, even longer than yeah. Evan Ginsberg and, and myself. So, we yeah. go back so far, and I really was appreciative that Alan, after you know X period of time, particularly when I moved up to the Bay Area to go to dental school, he wrote Mike Leno is the exclusive photographer for for his program, Action Wrestling yeah. Magazine. No, right. you know, you were when when we did a show, and I knew you were going to be announcing on the card. I knew it was going to be a great show. 
Good. You know, thank, just, thank just, you, I will, if you want to do something again, I will we, bring we some do. and some programs and stuff. And, we do. We do. Yeah. Not, we, we need to talk good. about Gary Kaiser. There's so much. Oh, yeah. Bruce Saki. Alan is a storefront, a historian of, of Bay Area knowledge. So we'll get yeah, back to that. We'll get back Gary to that. Gary Kaiser was again. so over. And I was the one that started calling the God, the Godfather. I just oh. kind of came out of, of, with that out of nowhere. And he says, I, I like that, you know. But I always told him, Kaiser, he would sit when he was manager with the Von Brauners. He would sit on the ring steps, which is like two feet from me at the at the press table. And people would throw oranges and they throw stuff and they try. And I says, don't <laughs> sit, sit on the other <laughs> side. Yeah, <laughs> it don't sit so close. So how would uh, anybody get a hold of you through social media if they wanted to get in touch with you? Uh, my email address, keyfabe key at AOL, K-E-Y-F-A-B-E. There's no, uh, I'm not kayfabing the kayfabe. <laughs> That is the email address. K -E -Y. You, you said that Rocky Johnson screwed up the spelling of that for you. He, uh, he got the, the kayfabe is spelled uh, K-A-Y-F-A-B-E. And he grabbed that first, right when I was looking for email addresses. So I took K-E-Y, which is second, second. Oh, uh, that's what second, I uh, yes. A, a funny, quickly, Rocky Johnson story. I remember they had a Richmond Auditorium. They had a huge dairy in those days, Royal Jersey Dairy. I took my mother. We went to the dairy, shopping, buying all stuff. And the guy says, aren't you the wrestling announcer? I say, yeah, yeah, that's me at the Cow Palace. I, well, do you know Rocky Johnson? And I said, well, of course. He's one of the big name wrestlers. Well, next time you see him, tell him he bounced a check here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking about what pay with interest now. Hard, Thinking of paybacking with interest now. And who would have thought... I always watched The Rock when he was a kid, sitting on Mother's lap at the Cow Palace. At who'd have thought he would have grown up to be this huge wrestler and star that that he is, The Rock. I mean, it's really amazing, thought? really amazing stuff. We we've been in the the center of a lot of greatness yes. here in the Bay Area, and it's glad that you were a part of it, and glad you're a part of. Well, uh, what made my experience great? Well, well, look at all the guys that Pat was once he got up there, and he was very close to Vince Jr. Even as early as '78, '79, he brought in Rocky Johnson, Don Morocco. He brought Fuji yeah. back, but he with the Office, right. Snuka, Buddy right. Rose. That was all, and Ray Stevens. It was all because yeah, all guys, Pat Patterson. Yeah. yeah, very true. And, well, and well, boy, there's sense. a guy we miss, nicest guy and class guy. And could sing a damn great, you know, Sinatra yeah. impersonation. Was Pat, Pat was Patterson. always, he was wild, but he was always a lot of fun to go out with. He always had a good time, you know, uh, and he loved the business too. I mean, Pat did extremely well. And, and Vince just thought the world of him with his wrestling mind and his ideas. And but I think he took all of that from Roy learned, as Pat learned yes. at the foot of Roy Shire. He took a yes. And Vern Gagne. So he took all that knowledge and Eddie Graham, all the people he worked yeah. for. And that's why he was so valuable to Vince because, man, you have all these great booking minds oh, yeah. all in one person. Amazing. And he and Roy had quite a falling out. Uh, Pat wanted to buy the territory and, and Roy wasn't ready now. And that's kind of where they parted their ways. And, and then Pat left and went on to much bigger, bigger things. And, yeah, we miss Pat. He, he lived a good life. He worked hard and he partied hard, you know. <laughs> yeah, he, he's quite the legend out here. Anyway, we're out of time for this Thank week, you. but it's really been That's great nice. catching up with you after all this time. And Thank you, we'll Thank you guys. On the show I'd love to come back. Yeah, let's bring Alan back because there's okay. we just scratched the surface on history. So, as we always say, see you at ringside. Absolutely. Or as John Swensky would say, kids, get <laughs> kids, away from the ring. Get away from the ring. Come on, kids, get away from that damn ring. <laughs> and here's how John Swinsky would introduce in the red corner, Peppa Gomez. <laughs> no inflection, nothing. <laughs> yeah. And then this, Joe, Joe Potkaiser, ring the bell. Joe, <laughs> ring the bell. <laughs> wow. Well, Alan, it's Thank great to see you again. Thank you for being on the show, and uh, we'll have you on again soon. Good Thank night, you. everyone. See you, see you next Good week. Good night, guys. Good night, Alan. Thank, Thank you. you.